What's the best way to address system failure? Is it planning? Well, I think planning is key, but not in the way a lot of people might mean, in that if you build a system and then try to plan for its failure, you get into really awkward situations. <laughs> um, sure. You know, right. Planning for something to fail when you build it is really, I think, the, the big key there. And because you should assume that you know, whatever you're going to do is going to fail, mm -hmm. and large pieces of it and unpredictable pieces, that one of the most straightforward ways to do that planning is to plan for recovery. Planning for failure is not the interesting part. It's planning for the success mm -hmm. after a failure. So uh, you know, it's really common to write programs and systems that try to catch and deal with every sort of individual failure. And you could think of that as planning for failure, but it's, it, it's sort of doomed, right? You can't predict all the different failures and you can't catch every combination of them. Mm -hmm. If you instead plan on how to get your system back to a successful operational state, no matter what just happened, then you can get, you know, you can achieve success, right? You can get to a point where failures can happen and you can quickly get back to the best possible state, that kind of recovery-oriented planning. Hmm. Uh, that's, I think, key to you know, planning for failure. So is recovery-oriented uh, planning, is that, is that how you fail gracefully? Yeah, so, that's, um, so failing gracefully is kind of a funny term, right? I, sure. I, I mostly want things that are actually failing to fail very ungracefully and very loudly. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the, the phrase failing gracefully mm -hmm. is sort of a useful code. And what we really tend to mean when we say that is to have an overall system degrade gracefully okay. when something it needs is failing. So, you know, graceful degradation, you know, a lot of that is really about planning your system again with very loose coupling and awareness of the presence or absence of other things you need, but not relying on the internal state of those other things. Okay. And so, you know, failing gracefully is, is really much more about, you know, of course, if some component of a system is failing, mm -hmm. the whole thing will degrade, right? That, that component was there for a reason. So, of course, you can't operate perfectly. Sure. The issue is how can you make your overall system perform as well as possible and you know, what that means is really a, a business decision, what your ideals are in that situation. In the case where it's missing some things that are, are failing, but some other elements of your overall system could still function if you've designed them to be that kind of independent. Okay. So how do you build a system without a single point of failure? What type of thinking goes into that? Sure. So I think that a, having something with a single point of failure is really more of a, a tool than a goal. Right? The goals are much more like the things we just talked about, about you know, graceful degradation and being able to handle failures. Mm -hmm. And where we end up when we're looking for systems with no single point of failure, it's really part of that same notion. Because if we think of a system that just has one big center that everything relies on, mm -hmm. when it fails, the rest of our system can't degrade gracefully. Sure. Right. So, right. you know, these topics are innately connected. Mm -hmm. And it's also, there's a little bit of a paradox. We sometimes think about building distributed systems in order to build more reliable things. Mm -hmm. But when you add more components, more computers, more software, you're adding more things that will fail, right? And the more components you have, whether hardware, software, network, whatever, in an overall system, the more often parts of it will be failing. And so as a system gets bigger and more complex, it becomes far more important that individual failures cause minimal impact to the overall system because they'll be happening more often. Sure. So how do you feel the distributed systems have changed over the last five years? Has the thinking changed significantly? So I think, I mean, there has been a lot of great research and deep thinking in distributed systems going on. And there's, there's tons of that happening right now that we could talk about. Mm -hmm. But I actually think the most important changes in distributed systems over the past few years have actually been in the accessibility and visibility of distributed systems work to more people. It used to be the case that if you wanted to do either experimentation or something, you know, business building or whatever that required interesting distributed systems work, mm -hmm. 
the capital expenditure, the services required, the, the software base were simply not there. And everybody that did that sort of thing had to start from scratch. And so there's a huge barrier to entry in doing interesting distributed systems work. So that's changing now and has mm. been for the past several years. Right? We have service providers like Amazon, Joyent, and other cloud providers right. like that. We also have the emergence of more general purpose distributed software. Like you know, React Core is one example, something that we've built at Basho, but there are others. Uh, it used to be that general purpose distributed system software didn't really, there wasn't much of it. Right? Mm -hmm. People built things very purpose built. And so again, you had to start from scratch. So I think that availability and accessibility, both of a software base and of the services and systems that people need, and so the widening of access to being able to try to do distributed systems work has actually probably been the most interesting change of the past few years. So last question for you, and flipping that a bit. Uh, looking ahead, how do you see distributed systems evolving over the next five years or so? Well, I'd say that part of uh, what's going to happen is, you know, is, is also the other side of, of the answer to the past, which is that by having so many more people be exposed to distributed systems, right? Whether or not it's you know, a given, say, software developer's job to do that sort of thing, more and more people are being exposed to these ideas in the systems they use, whether it's because you know, their company's software is hosted in a cloud or because of something else they're using. And that exposure, I think, is going to have an effect on general thinking about software and the ways that people are going to have to think about concurrency, and about interconnectedness of components in a way that not all traditional software developers have, have had to do. Uh, so that's part of it, in that I mm -hmm. think that, that notion of accessibility also has another side, which is that it, the people that aren't doing that work are going to be exposed to it much more. And I think that will affect even work that's not in distributed systems. Mm. But even in sort of what really is happening next in distributed systems, I think one of the important developments we're going to see is more emphasis on connecting formal models with actual running systems. Right? We're at a pretty good state now when it comes to local programs, about being able to analyze them and say lots of things about a, a piece of software we've written in terms of its local behavior. Mm -hmm. But with distributed systems, there's been a divergence over the years. Right? There's been lots of good formal models for describing distributed systems. And there's been a lot of development work but there hasn't historically been a lot of concrete connection in that you could do the kind of formal analysis of, a, of an actual system. Mm -hmm. And we're just now starting to see uh, you know, declarative approaches to actual system building. Um, a good example there would be the Bloom Project at Berkeley, for instance, mm -hmm. um, run by Joe Hellerstein. And he and his students are doing some amazing work where you can write declarative distributed systems specifications that are runnable. And so you can do formal analysis and get the same kinds of assurance about a distributed program that we've been able to do with local programs. Sure. Yeah, that, that would be a pretty big deal. Right? Yeah, I, I believe that's going to have right. a, whether that work or things that come as a result of it, that general direction is going to have a pretty big impact. Right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate it. My pleasure.